Hello everyone, this is Defense Politics Asia and uh, this is the real, real Ukraine War Day 80 catch up. So uh, if you have watched the previous two uh, videos, uh, one from the Russian perspective and one from the Ukrainian perspective, uh, thank you for watching and uh, wasting 15 minutes to half an hour of your life. Uh, but thank you so much for uh, still getting so many likes and uh, if it irritates the hell out of you, don't worry. I also feel very irritated by myself. Uh, it's cringy as fuck. So anyway, um, this is the real catch up video for day 80. Uh, I'm going to talk with normal, normal voice. I uh, hope you are glad that I actually speak like this. And uh, let's get started. So for those that this video is especially useful for those that are uninitiated or you know you fo started following the war uh days or months after it start started and then you might realize that uh, there might be a lot to absorb and uh to digest and it might be a bit uh hard on you because people will think that you are crazy or you're noob uh, when you make comments because uh you miss probably miss a lot of context so this video will be perfect for you so um in late february so now we start in late february uh the russians launched a I quote, a special military operation against Ukraine. And this military operation uh, is with the intention to actually, uh, let's see, do I have this here? Mm, uh, nope. So anyway, the intention, whoops, is actually to uh, liberate the Luhansk People's Re Republic and the Donetsk People Republic. Basically, the Luhansk Oblast and the Donetsk Oblast. Together, they are also known as Donbas. And Crimea has been already been annexed. Uh, so this is Crimea. This is Luhansk. This is Donetsk. So uh, Crimea has been annexed, but uh, officially is not recognized, which is why the Russians want to use this special military operation to force the Ukrainians to recognize the ceding of this territory, uh, this, this entire peninsula to the Russians. And they also wanted to demilitarize Ukraine because Ukraine is sits in the middle of NATO and Russia and these two major military power in the middle as a buffer state has no need for a powerful military uh, at least from the point of view of the Russians and and to have such a powerful and a dangerous military it might actually be a kind of a danger because uh, Ukraine actively wanted to join the NATO and Ukraine reportedly has second or the third most uh, biggest military in Europe. In fact, uh, based on what I have seen so far in the war, if Ukraine decided to invade westward, instead of fighting with Russia, if they decided to fight westward, they would have easily conquered Slovakia and Hungary, perhaps even Romania, easily, easily. Uh, maybe Poland not so much because Poland uh, has Con or continue to invest heavily into their military and uh, however if let's say they were to invade Romania, Hungary, Slovakia it would be easy for for Ukraine in fact Moldova will be a sure sure on uh, conquered by Ukraine so that's how powerful Ukraine is and even with Germany or Italy or France to come and aid Slovakia or Hungary it wouldn't be enough in my opinion and that's how powerful the Ukraine is and that's how how this is why the war seems really slow from how we expect of a superpower um, fighting in Ukraine and the, the 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 perceived slow speed is actually because Ukraine is actually uh, really doing really well and the military is quite strong which is why there is this uh, intention for Russia to demilitarize Ukraine and they want Ukraine as I mentioned, not to join any military alliance. So that is what the Russia demands. And also, of course, there's also this famous uh, denazification uh, because in Ukraine, the, despite they have a Jewish Jewish president, uh, Ukraine is actually a very corrupted country. Uh, in fact, before this war, I bet you didn't even care about Ukraine, right? Because it's such a backwater in Europe and uh, it's really, you know, people don't really give a damn about it. Any mention of Ukraine is usually related or linked with corruption, oligarchs, and uh, political intrigues, and uh, 
and also uh, and neo-Nazis uh, activities and extremism, uh, right-wing extremism within this country. And because the politics is so complicated in Ukraine, uh, you can have actually a Jewish president and uh, still have uh, neo-Nazi activities uh, present e even within the military. There is no... Uh, in fact, uh, I don't think Zelensky have a uh, full control over the country and there is a lot of political factions or power or factions within the same party or even the same control that is making life really difficult uh, to even run the whole country because Ukraine is massive. It's a very, very big country. So don't underestimate how difficult it is to actually rule over such a country. So, uh, so which is why uh, if you been following you'll be real you'll realize that uh all these new nazi factions and extremists tends to be thrown all the way to the eastern front uh before the war started they're already there and basically zelensky uh push them far far away let them have fun uh do whatever you uh, know cosplaying shit they, they like and uh far away from the political center so that zelensky can actually run the country without a uh, disturbance from these uh, extremist factions or elements uh, which is why uh, to the Russians, they want to de eliminate and destroy this entire faction or elements of neo-Nazi activities. And in fact, it is accurate because uh, most of these, like for example, the right sector or the Azov Battalion, they are all based in the East. They are not really in the West that much. So that is the overall picture. But for Ukraine, uh, it is much more complicated. So Ukraine... Uh, Zelensky is in a very difficult situation because, uh, like I mentioned about how the political intrigue, they are not. He's not able to surrender at all. Surrender means cutting off any territory, including including Crimea, to the Russians. He cannot sign any kind of this kind of agreement, or his life will be in danger. He can be assassinated, uh, by whoever is within uh his country, or at whatever powers that is behind him. So, he actually don't have any solutions. And if you look at the propaganda coming out from Ukraine, uh, even from the start of the war until today, uh, whatever they say during the negotiation, saying that you know they are willing to negotiate, negotiate, you know, they want an Article Five kind of guarantee, whatever nonsense, you can just ignore all of this because in the end, the ultimate um, line that Zelensky have put out uh, in the internal propaganda and things that he said to the media is basically they will not surrender and they will fight to the end and liberate Luhansk, Donetsk and even take back Crimea. How are they going to do it against a military superior Russia? I have no idea. Perhaps they are going for a Vietnam War kind of uh, scenario where they, they see themselves as the North Vietnamese and hopefully you know, defeat a superpower like the Americans. In, in this case, Russia in a probably a decisive victory somehow forcing uh, uh, the entire war be to become uh, politically untenable within Russia and hopefully get a mass withdrawal away from the Ukraine Ukrainian territory. And I believe that is probably uh, the war that Ukraine is fighting, which is why they want all the equipment, money and resources as much as they can. And they will drag this out as long as they possibly can. And at this moment, Ukraine is rather successful at it and they have been really dragging it out uh, dragging it out like really dragging it out so they are doing really well because the military is rather strong so uh, that is the strategic uh, objective or in terms of a strategic picture of uh, in terms of the diplomatic front looking into the uh, military wise military front uh, let's look at uh, the territory first uh, from the U Russian perspective um, Okay, let's let's go from um, what happened uh, in in the early in late February. In late February, the Russians launched a special military operation, and they rushed their forces uh, from five different fronts. From this corner here in Belarus, uh, between uh, in the tri tri border of Belarus, Russia, and Ukraine, they launched an attack towards Chernihiv, and there's another force going towards from uh, Sumy. And both forces actually uh, surround Sumi and Shenanhiv and they, as they rush down to Kiev. And then there was a there was a major airborne landing uh, 
in hostile mail here in this airbase or international airport as they wanted to use this airport to reinforce because uh it was literally for me to realize that they were, they were, they were, they actually have trouble going to be crossing over here so there is good reason to believe that the russians actually uh passed through uh part of belarus uh land in order or in order to actually capture uh the Sh chernobyl nuclear power plant region uh but i don't think they crossed in through here they probably crossed in through here and this front this situation this is what you see on day 15 you can see that this is the front that more or less looks like um, around 14 days into you no know, 15 days into the war and they continue to keep up this uh shape up to the day 30 of sorts the however as the ukrainians uh launched their mobilization uh okay so i forgot to talk about the south so this is northern part and it's around ukf but russians do not have enough forces to actually take kiev and probing attacks shows that there is a uh, sufficient uh resilience and uh, defenses and defenders are willing to fight in kiev so they did not uh, go further in kiev in the southern front uh the russian push towards uh capturing of Kherson, capturing of uh, Kahova, Kahovka, uh, Nova Kahovka area because there is a nuclear, uh, there's a hydroelectric power plant over here and they actually push for Anohoda which is there is a nuclear power plant over here and then they captured uh, Melitopo, Tokmak and then they spread across and then hold this line, this major line uh, which I then call the Zaporizhia line as you can see uh, in day 25 till now is basically the same line even day 15 they already controlled the line since day 15 and then they did this uh pincer from both sides where they go from the crimea crimea side take badians and go to mariupol and then from the donet side they they attack from the east and then they surrounded mariupol and then they pushed northwards towards capturing of vunovaka which is a major stronghold for the ukrainians and then they push up to the current line that is uh, at um, at this location at Olenivka, uh, Olenivka, this line all the way to Palivka, Voleda area, to Velika Novosilka uh, area here. So this line has been uh, back and forth a little bit uh, and it has been maintained more or less in this situation for the past two months of sort. So on the Donia side, this is the major offense. Uh, everything along this uh, eastern front uh, is basically a stalemate the Luhan side on the Luhan side they have a lot of success they are able to break the defense line and then go northward cap capturing Starobilsk, uh, Bilovosk and then they, they, they do uh, this massive uh, turn towards the west and then they capture all the territory of Luhansk and then they go all the way to their border and then they redeploy and then they and then they fought southwards and then that's what we are currently looking at um the then the the forces that entered uh to kharkiv kharkiv region so that there's actually five fronts as i mentioned there's one two three four and this is the fifth the kharkiv front so the the russians actually go all the way to kharkiv and then they actually surrounded kharkiv on uh, two or three sides in a way leaving the southern side only open uh, as the russians are unable to close it and they push all the way to balaklia and that's about it and then from over the past two months they continue to try to fight south through Izium, which was a very hard fight this i think this fight took three weeks before they can secure Izium, and then they actually push southwards so however around two two months around two months ago the russians decided to withdraw from the northern front because uh because it seems like they are unable to hold uh hold this uh hold this front because this is a really huge area as you can see if i push out is this area is probably as big as estonia or perhaps uh, as big as denmark so given the number of forces that they have uh here here which is probably ranging maybe around 50,000 troops 
is unable to hold such a huge territory. And not to mention, they need to uh, spend uh, logistics, uh, supply line, as well as uh, resources to feed the people that they have uh, taken control over. So they decide, the Russians uh, decided to withdraw uh, after seeing that the Ukrainians seems to be, uh, be willing to negotiate a bit and they use this uh, withdrawal as a as a excuse you know use this negotiation um, progress as an excuse to withdraw and they say that oh, okay in a good will we will withdraw away from kiev but of course uh ukraine never wanted to really negotiate which i actually mentioned during those days when i was covering uh the war i i already mentioned that based on the propaganda ukraine have no interest in actually making a deal and the anyway the russians withdrew away from Shannon Heath region, Kiev region and Sumi region and totally withdrawn away and leaving only the Kharkiv region which is not exactly part of the plan as well as uh, Kherson and Zoporizhia area which is also not supposedly part of the plan. The in terms of but it, for the Russian actions uh, in Kherson and Zaporizhia area they started to introduce the rubles, the Russian rubles, the Russian currency and they have uh, in, in in fact, uh, recently in Mil Militopol, they have started to even issue uh, a totally new license plate that uh, that actually uh, writes the word uh, Taurite, uh, TVR, a uh, short form, uh, which means that there is a strong intention for the Russians to actually annex this area, the Kherson and the Militopol or south of Zaporizhia region as a separate People's Republic. Most likely that's what they were going to do. So this looks like the case. However, on the Kaki front, that is not so clear because here, despite they actually uh, retrain the teachers uh, in Kherson and Zaporizhia to teach Russian uh, at curriculum, they actually also send the Kharkiv teachers for the same training. And they are actually sending teachers from Crimea to come and teach in Kharkiv. However, they are, they are starting to lose the positions in north of the Kharkiv city. And the only thing that is uh, saving this entire Kharkiv region here is the river here, uh, the Sabinsky Donetsk River. And it is unclear if the Russians will continue to keep this area at all. And, and the Ukrainians are doing some successful attacks until they are now stuck uh, because the, whatever is left over seems to be Russian strongholds. Uh, Kozacha Lopan here is one of the known ones which the Ukrainians have tried five to six times to try to attack and they have failed every single time with heavy losses. And there's another one that seems to be at Fersele where there is actually a, a, a offense by offensive by the Ukrainians as on the 12th of May and has been repelled. So there might be two strongholds uh, in the north of Kharkiv city and we are not sure how whether the Russians will continue to hold this position which brings us to the rest of Kharkiv because if the Russians are not going to hold in this region and the the amount of publicity and uh, propaganda that have, they have shot in this region then the people around this region was like will likely to be uh, suffering or even tortured um, based on uh, past behaviors of the Ukrainian forces as they recapture grounds there are special branch unit or or you know the special service or secret service kind of thing uh, their version of SSB or CIA they have been uh, arresting anyone who have remotely seems to be uh, been friendly with the Russians um, or even provided information to the Russians or be pro or be pro Russian in any way uh, publicly and the people here will suffer should the Russian uh, should the Ukrainians retake this position so uh, the people here is taking a huge risk and I'm not sure whether the Russians will actually uh, sacrifice them in to use them as a <clears throat> as a tactical retreat area uh, to buy time with uh, space. So this is a uh, rather concerning uh, if you look at a humanitarian point of view. For the so for the battlefront wise, uh, let's start from Loha. Uh, let's not let's ignore you, Kharkiv, uh, because uh, I have already kind of mentioned this situation where the Ukrainians try to recapture the nor northern side of uh, Kharkiv city 
and they have no means of going into the other space of Kharkiv. At the Luhan side, the as you can see the Luhan's border, most of Luhan has been captured, uh, leaving just a, a re relatively small area where several Donetsk, Luhan's, uh, Lusitian's city is. Another major city that was Popasna was already captured and the Russians are now uh, spilling out of the Popasna region and trying to probably do an encirclement to this to to this to destroy and capture uh Herske and Zolote area. And this there's a massive push all along this entire front. There is also the Russians trying to cross uh the Savisky Donetsk River over at this side. However, the crossing seems to have failed. Uh as far as I can tell, uh despite uh, almost a week of fighting uh at this crossing there seems to be no uh, strong beach head or uh, bridge head in any of this area. So this this uh may be credit to uh, the well pe well preparation uh, the preparation that is well done by the Ukrainians or uh the Americans say, or Americans or some propaganda say that it's because the American artillery is damn good. So we're not not sure what's the reason or it's just because uh the Russians have not been able to uh, hide their movement within this forested area and the Ukrainians have been waiting for them in an ambush. So most likely it will be the later, the latest point where the Ukrainians are actually been waiting for them, uh, monitoring their movement through the forested area. And as they cross, they got bombarded. And that's most likely the case. The, in terms of the, this area, the city areas here, the Russians have kept, captured this major city of Rubizne after a month or so of fighting. And then they are now trying to push towards into the major city of Severodonets. Uh, the Ukrainians have blown up all the bridges here. So any crossing would probably take some kind of a pontoon crossing uh, to, to be able to actually cross over. However, there is uh, some territory that the uh, Russian forces or Luhan's forces can actually penetrate uh, or attack through. But it's all very forested and it's very defendable. So let's see how this goes as we go go on. But this is only letting just 10% of uh, Luhan's. So this part of the operation is probably uh, in this closing stage, I guess. Uh, but is this closing stage will probably still take uh, two months, I guess. And then for the Donetsk region, as you can see, the this this part, this entire Donetsk region is only half done. Uh, they have effectively have captured Mariupol, leaving just some uh, token forces stuck within the Azov style uh, area, the South Azov style plant. You probably have uh, seen on the mainstream media a lot about Mariupol. Uh, the reality of the situation is the Russian forces have already captured the city. Uh, this, the only defenders are left in the, in the, within this uh, wasteland of uh as of style plan and there's heavy bombardment and artillery strike on them on a daily basis they are all hiding in, in the base uh in the underground bunkers or basements and the russians are actively trying to uh take grounds and uh, trying to wash them out or flush them out but effectively the city is in russian control there is no doubt about that the Donetsk front is a lot more complicated for the Russian forces because of how entrenched the, the Ukrainians has been. Uh, I highly recommend you to go and read up and search more about uh, the things that happened during the Donbass Civil War as well as what what caused it uh, in the overthrowing of Yan Yanukovych, I think is his name, the president of uh, Ukraine and then causing all the cascading uh, chain of events that uh, caused this war that we are watching now. So the Ukrainians have been preparing this uh, defense line for seven, six, seven years. So this, this defense line is extremely uh, strong, especially it doesn't uh, make it easier when the Ukrainians also uh, entrench themselves within the city areas, which the Russian forces seems to be really reluctant to hit. Uh, although they still hit, the, as long as they have good intel that there is Ukrainian forces within a residential building or school, doesn't matter they will just hit it uh, so but there is a situation so there's not a lot of changes in terms of uh, no major changes in terms of the fronts there are some movement here and there but 
nothing very very significant so the russians have been trying to flank it then they have been attacking through Vatican Nova Circle, but even this point, they were kind of stuck. That's why they have started trying to you know, attack from the north through Izium and then through this uh, this entire forested area as well as the river. But the Ukrainians have been uh, really proficient and competent and they have so far limited the Russian advance more or less around this, kind, this front line for the past uh, two, three weeks. So, uh, if you see this if you if you are pro ukrainian if you if you want to think this is successful then this is successful uh, but the war is still young we are only at uh, coming to three months in this war so in terms of the zaporizhia line as well as mikolaev kairi if you look at this border line uh, or this front line the russian seems to be more or less happy with uh, what they they have captured at this moment and probably even this part of uh Kherson, i don't think the russians want it they probably want this part but uh the, the ukrainians have dug in themselves so it's not so straightforward for the russians because here there's a this there's this river here and uh the russians might seem to be really happy to just keep uh the eastern side of this river territory so so i, I i'm not expecting any kind of uh, changes within these two fronts i believe the russians will play a defensive uh, war in this region and i don't think they will cap go on to capture miko life not at the moment not when they have not uh, liberate luhans or donets from the ukrainian control so the russians actually have a very good opportunity to capture miko uh city in the first two weeks of the war however they did not do it uh, they have this very lackluster kind of uh, approach towards miko life when the defenses were still in a mess and after that, Mikolaev become a stronghold and uh, it's very, very entrenched. So at this moment, Mikolaev is untakeable unless uh, the Russians going to pull in a lot of forces, which I don't think they will. So out outside of this front, there is also Trinistria. So Trinistria, there is around uh, 1,500 or, or some rumor 2,500 uh, Russian servicemen that is acting as peacekeeper in this region in the west uh, eastern edge of Moldova, so this is a breakaway state uh which have uh in from if, if you based on history of and how the soviet union worked they have their rights to actually go independent however moldova kind of disputed it uh, and then they they are supposedly to be supposed to be the same country and they kind of have this fight and uh Despite this, just a, such a small piece of land, Moldova seems to be unable to capture it, and the uh, Russians came in and uh, brokered this peace, this this kind of peace treaty. Moldova actually uh, came out the winner in a way. They continue to thrive and do well. Well, Trinistria continued to you know live in the Soviet era, and they are very poor and and the only thing that is keeping them alive is actually Moldova. To be honest but moldova have no interest in uh militarily conquering transnistria and they are very happy with this current situation maybe because transnistria can act as a very good uh cheap labor territory where they can actually throw all the all the factories there that they want to have cheap labor and probably that is actually benefiting both moldova because anything that transnistria want to export moldova they have to go through moldova territory and maybe moldova can actually benefits from it but the Ukrainians are very tempted to actually at invade into Transnistria because there is a lot of uh, Soviet era ammunition, especially in this, uh, in this ammunition base south of Kobasna, and they are very very tempted, but they don't dare to do it because they are Western uh, sponsors. Uh, do not want this war to spill out of Ukraine. And Moldova is very uh, nervy because they they are living very peacefully with Transnistria, and they actually have do not have the military to resist should Ukraine uh, invade into Moldova territory, which includes Transnistria. And uh, there is NATO forces uh, gathering within Romania and uh, in a posture which also unnerved Moldova. And the Russians have been trying very hard to cool down 
the situation around here despite uh there is a lot of provocation and terrorist attack i think they they, they even caught one or two uh saboteurs in Transnistria. so things are looking a bit nervy around here but uh thankfully Transnistrian government and moldova government are together and they are both determined to make sure that war do not break out between them and ukraine have offered moldova if you need help to invade and take back Transnistria, they are going to send forces in uh, as i mentioned ukraine have a very huge military so they can fight this war and still send forces into Transnistria. but moldova have not uh, respond to or wanted something like this everything status quo is the best for moldova at this moment and then um, we have this also of course uh, this snake island situation so Snake Island actually sits on a reserve of uh, natural gas or oil underneath the sea here. However, there is no military. Uh, they, to me, they, to me, okay, this to me, there is no military uh, point into holding this island because the uh, at least for the Ukrainians because they are unable to defend the island because they have no proper navy, whereas the the Russians have a, the Black Sea fleet. Uh, dominating the entire Black Sea. So to try to capture this uh, island without a navy is pointless. For the Russians, they can still keep it because they have full control over the Black Sea. And uh, so that is the situation. Whatever happens on the island is kind of pointless because it doesn't really affect anything on the mainland. So, so this is the general uh, catch-up video for whatever is happening in Ukraine. And if you want to go into details into the battlefronts, then I, I will encourage you to watch and follow uh, the channel on the summaries, on the daily summaries or the every other two day, every other two day summaries where you actually actually you know can hear more details specifically on the specific battlegrounds and battlefronts. Uh, but this is just a catch up into what uh, what had happened in Ukraine. Anything else? For example, Bucha or you know all the alleged you know hu human right offenses, you can just ignore them. It's a waste of time. People will forget about it uh, eventually. Uh, especially if Russia win. If Russia wins, then uh, all these things will be all gone. Then you will hear human right abuses about the from the Ukrainians, about from the Ukrainian soldiers. If the Rush Ukrainian win, then you will probably hear a lot about Bucha and other you know alleged uh, offenses by russian soldiers so it's, it's just about uh, the winner dictating the history so don't think too much about it anyway this is the catch-up video the real one and i'll see you in the next update